Tell me a little bit about the, the infant-based interventions. When I came here first, the tool we had was the Newborn Behavioral Assessment Scale. And I became the one who's managed that whole training program. And that was a tool that Barry developed with some of his colleagues. But the beauty of it was it really captured the baby's individuality. And when I first saw Barry with the baby, I realized, oh my God, there's something quite magical about this. Uh, quite remarkable that from the very beginning, you could see the baby had an agenda, had hopes, had aspirations, and was ready to engage. And it was the social element of the baby that struck me. But as we were doing this as an assessment, mothers and fathers were always peeking over my shoulder watching me. And I could see they were transfixed by what was happening in their baby. And I suddenly realized, oh my goodness, this is a powerful, if you like, intervention model. It's a powerful tool that would engage parents. So I began to think about the clinical use of this assessment tool. So shifting it from an assessment per se to being something that helps parents understand the babies better. And so the focus was still very much on who is this little boy or girl? How can we capture his very personhood? who he really is. Not so much what he can do, but who he is. And therefore help parents begin to engage with him as a person and form that relationship from the very, very beginning. And that was, I think, the, the big breakthrough for me. And watching Barry, and then suddenly realizing that this is a powerful tool that I think could benefit parents everywhere. And so that's what we began to focus on, on the NBO. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the interventions as context. Tell me about uh, what you're studying, what, what your most recent study has found. Well, I think that we began to see that this was a powerful way that would sensitize parents to the baby's behavior. And it would foster the relationship. So our first goal was to say, can this really, if you like, enhance the parent-child relationship, their sense of attunement, their sense of engagement? Can it foster the relationship? So that was our first series of studies that we did with Jessica and others to really see if, in fact, we could effectively, if you like, promote the relationship between parent and child, that sense of attunement. And that really worked. But we also thought perhaps this could also reduce uh, postpartum depression. And in fact, that the baby could be, if you like, a catalyst in helping the mother see the baby or the father see, see the glasses half full rather than half empty. That was just a hypothesis. But so far, that seems to be working. We just have two pilot studies at the moment which show that, in fact, it was able, we were able to reduce postpartum depression symptoms. Now, they're all short-term. They have to be replicated in a much bigger sample. Fortunately, we have such a study going on in Aros in Denmark at the moment, another in Reykjavik in Iceland, another in uh, Johannesburg, and another in Melbourne. So we really think this is a very promising, if you like, tool to both foster the parent-child relationship, but also reduce postpartum depression. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about what the clinicians would do um, yes. to, to implement the program, how they would work with the, with the parents and the child? The invitation always is to say, let's look at your baby together, see what can your baby tell us. So it's not to say, I'm going to examine the baby. It's not an examination. It's a, a, a shared discovery. And if you like, the parent is an absolute partner in this uh, exploration. So it's a discovery, and we don't know who this little baby is. And even the clinician may have seen thousands of babies, as I have, but you've never met this baby before. So you want to make sure that this baby has a chance to tell his or her story. So the two stories will be present in this intervention, so to speak. You want to capture the baby's story, the who, who am I, and the family story, who are we? What do we think about? What are the stresses we face? Or what are the supports we have at this moment in time? and try to draw them all together in this infant-focused, family-centered approach. So it is a series of maneuvers. So first, if the baby's asleep, we <laughs> shake a rattle in the baby's ear. <laughs> it sounds, yes. It's actually to disturb the baby's sleep, but it's, it's the world. It's the world of cars, airplanes, doors banging, telephones ringing. It's an unpredictable world. How can the baby protect his sleep in the face of this? And we see sleep organizations, one of the big challenges every little baby faces in the first months of life. Can I maintain a good sleep-wake cycle? That's one of the first things we look at. Then if the baby um, wakes up, we look at the baby's tone, how the baby likes to be held, 
the level of activity, how much support the baby might need. And they're all things the parent will see. We never tell the parent what to do. It's a non-didactic approach. The minute I tell, give a parent advice, I feel I've done them a disservice because they have to go into their own skins as parents. So our goal is to help them go into that skin. So if the baby cries, then we welcome, we see what, what happened here? Why is he upset? And how can we help him settle? And then as I share things, do you pick him up? Do you just talk to him? Do you put your hand on his tummy? Do you rock him? All these things, maybe even sing to him in some cultures. And then finally, the icing on the cake, if possible, if the baby is in a quite alert state, we begin to engage him, either with a red ball, so you're tracking, or a shake to a rattle, or more importantly, of course, look him in the eye and say, hi there, and see if he'll engage. And that, I think, is often a revelation, because it's in this face-to-face -face engagement, these almost moments of meeting, where a real emotional exchange takes place. The mom and dad realize, oh my goodness, this is my little boy, my little girl, and we're in a relationship. And that's what we hope to achieve over the course of these observations, because it's not just one. There might be one in the hospital, but we follow through, hopefully, in the home and the clinic, wherever else, over the course of the first months of life. How many months? Just three, just three. So it's a very narrow window, but uh, we think that it's such pivotal things are happening. For the baby, he's trying to figure out this new extra uterine world. How do I manage night and day, crying, settling down? The parents, they become parents to this little baby. The father and mother, or partners, are trying to work on their relationship. And siblings, they're also trying to figure out how do we bring on this little boy or girl into our lives and grow as a family. And if you're lucky, you're in a bigger, wider community. And I've had an NBO with parents, grandparents, and even neighbors. And this is getting to know who this little person is going to change everybody's life in this neighborhood. That's at the best of times. How does this help the parent? Well, she begins to see, or he begins to see the baby really as a person, begins to attribute meaning. See, the baby really has intentions. The baby has a mind. We'd like them to be able to wonder at what does the little baby want or think about. So it's trying to get this mindset to see the baby as somebody with his own mind, heart, intentions, and to be able to read his cues to get an entree into this. Because we say that the only language your little baby has is his behavior. So whether it's color change, he changes color, this isn't by accident, it's a sign of stress. You know, or if his eyes begin to bulge out of his head, he may be overstimulated. Reading these subtle cues, whether it's gaze aversion, or even tucking his hands and frowning, all these things, the only language your little baby has to say, this is who I am, this is what I feel. Tell me about the findings, and, and if you could tell me a little bit about the study. Well, the most recent one I can talk about, I suppose, that Beth McManus and I and a few of us worked on, it really worked with babies who are at risk, so babies who do early intervention. And so we randomized them into an intervention group and a control group. So these were babies with, with issues, if you like. And we again worked with them to see what could we do to support them. Because these babies were, if you like, dysregulated. They were harder to get to know. They, had, they were in the clearly, with clear cut cues. So our goal was to see how can we help understand the baby's uh, sort of agenda, if you like, and be, uh, uh, address, help a challenging baby reach some kind of regulation, help him organize himself, whether it's asleep or crying or even availability. So they were slightly challenging. But in the study, we found out that, in fact, it's a short follow-up, but four and six months. So we can't really shout from the housetops. It's just encouraging data that, in fact, it seemed to work. Particularly, we were encouraged because it turned out the mothers in the intervention group had a higher rate of depressive symptoms. And that it worked with them made us very encouraged that this, in fact, was a powerful support for them. So how it worked, again, it's, it's we just believe that helping them become more aware of the baby, allowing the baby to draw them out of themselves, if that's not too awkward a, a, a phrase, to begin to see them as a person, somebody who needed them and whom they, they could in turn even enjoy and get satisfaction and, and 
and uh, encouragement from the way the baby responded to that. How are scientists able to measure that impact on the mother? Well, we have, there are classic measures. The one we, the Center for Epidemiological Studies, depression scale, is the one we used in this particular study. We've used the Edinburgh and others, which is more of a screen. But the CESD is more commonly used as uh, a measure of the symptoms of depression. Now, of course, to be quite frank, we should follow up much longer to make sure these, these findings remain stable. And that we don't know. That, that's the challenge we have to uh, as a face for the future. We just think we've got uh, a good start with the data now. And also the studies showing that fathers are more involved. One study in Japan was able to engage fathers more. So, but all in terms of the relationship again. And uh, professionals, and that's not insignificant. We found many findings that the, uh, that the clinicians themselves feel sort of, if you like, reinforced in their professional roles. And it's not insignificant, they make a difference in this more relational way. But for them, the biggest thing they have to give up is try not to be teachers. To show rather uh, than to tell. And not neither, and, and, but only to show the baby, right. not themselves, or not yet not to tell exactly. Let the baby tell the story so that's very cool she is. What do these findings suggest to you? Suggest to me that the first months of life are really pivotal in the lifespan. Now, every period in life is pivotal, adolescence, etc. But if you as a clinician want to really work with a family, this is a period of, I would say, the almost the intervention, intervention moment par excellence in the lifespan because so much is happening. And over the course of human history, it's a time when other people, outsiders, padrinos, uh, godparents, uh, allo parents were allowed in. And even nurse midwives when I was growing up in Ireland, she became part of the family story. I feel we are so privileged if we're there and families invite us in to be with them at what I think is one of the most pivotal moments in the, th their history as a family. So we, in fact, I think become, for kind, understanding, uh, empathic, non-judgmental, we would be welcomed. And if in turn then we help, dis help them discover the baby, I think our, I feel like, relationship is sealed for many, many years to come. If you had three takeaways or three um, tips for parents, behavior tips, um, that you would want them to know, especially in relation to yeah. the study, what, what would those be? I'd say just observe your baby day in, day out, and acknowledge that every little behavior a baby is showing you is it's his only way he wants to talk to you. His language, you can trust your baby's language. And I think trust yourself in making sense of that. And together then, you come to an understanding. NBO stands for? Newborn Behavioral Observations System. And the reason, I'm glad you asked that, because it's not an assessment. It's a shared observation that's trying to capture the baby's language. And I suppose above all, I want to emphasize that. So, and I think that's why parents are happy to invite us in because they suddenly feel, for the first time, people are not judging them. And even if it's an early intervention, home visitor, or a nurse, or a doctor, they're there as allies, as partners. And the baby really is the focus. Is this um, system available in some hospitals? I think it's quite new. Um, I'm very happy to say, let's say, the state of Ohio will be uh, taking it in for all the early intervention programs in the fall. and. Um, so it varies. Uh, it, uh, surprisingly, in places like Denmark and certain municipalities, it's what every parent gets. So that would be our long-term health care or policy goal, if you will, that we think this is something that every parent can benefit from. But obviously, it's a public uh, health policy initiative. In the UK, fortunately, it also is recommended for all home visits that they use the NBO in the work with parents, and we're very pleased with that. We'd like to see the same happening here in North America, obviously. Here in Massachusetts, there are a few hospitals? Yes, there are a few hospitals, and one very nice study actually at the Berkshires, um, at the Stockbridge area, by the, uh, and my colleague there at the Austin Riggs Center, Claudia uh, Gold, uh, she has a study there which is implemented or, or integrated, I should say, the NBO into a whole community. We're intrigued to see how it works in a rural community. So every baby in the local hospital is a supposed NBO and then they all get home visits. And the idea is to build up this sort of community sense from the very beginning around the support for the baby. So that would be our model for the future, yes.
Is there anything I didn't ask you that you would want to, uh, people um, to know? I think the big thing, an interesting thing, uh, you asked such so good things, yeah. Cindy, uh, that w I feel good about this approach because it's cultural universality. Because of no teaching involved, it's, it's been used successfully, let's say, in Johannesburg in the townships. It's been used with Aboriginal groups up in, uh, in uh, Australia. It's been used in different cultures because, in a way, the meaning making is by the parents of the culture. So I don't interfere with the parent when she says, oh yes, that's what I think he's doing. One sort of validates, supports, occasionally reframes, but clarifies and helps the parent understand the baby. And I think, I, I feel very pleased that it's used in different cultures around the world, and I don't think it's uh, any way uh, contrary to the, it, it fits in with the cultural beliefs, and that's what it's designed to do with the group uh, with whom we're working. Do you have an area of expertise within psychology, child psychology? Yes, I suppose really, <laughs> really, even the first three years is really uh, my, my area of expertise. If you could tell me a little bit about your background, where you did your studies. Well, born and raised in Ireland, which is my uh, just outside Dublin and got my early education in Ireland and came here to Boston and uh, spent many years in the Philippines by the way that's all other story but uh, but came here to the States and came to Boston College and where I studied philosophy and psychology and uh, but at that time I got a job working as a research assistant in a project called the Brookline Early Education Project which is one of the first family-centered interventions that we had in the country. And I was very new, very fresh, so I had everything to learn. So I was just lucky somebody opened the door to me. And in fact, it was Connie Kiefer and Barry Brasson who opened the door as I began to look at this material. And see, they were focusing on very, very young infants. I, until that moment, thought that because they couldn't talk, they weren't thinking. I had no idea about the inner life a very young child. But the more I observed them, I could see that they had very rich emotional lives. They could be upset, disappointed, afraid, and yet full of happiness. And uh, they were so engaged in their world that it was a, uh, such a revelation to me. So that's how I got into this field. But it was Barry, the one in this very office, who invited me in the door. That was 40 years ago, and I've been working here ever since.